It's the mid-1930s. The worst of the Great Depression is over. And as the economy recovers, more and more U.S. households can afford the high-tech device that's transforming how the world communicates. The telephone. From 1933 on, the percentage of households in the U.S. with a telephone goes up every year. It'll reach 90% by 1970. And with rapid adoption in the 1930s, telephone companies have a problem. Their infrastructure may not be set up to meet future demand. Do they need more phone lines to handle next year's call volume, or do they have enough already? To answer this question, they need to predict future telephone traffic based on this year's traffic and on the number of households projected to have a telephone next year. Several methods had been proposed to do this under certain conditions. But in 1937, a Dutch engineer named Krautoff writes a paper tearing them all apart and pointing out ways that their assumptions are either absurd, self-contradictory, or meaningless. Krautoff then proposes a better method. And it's great. But what Krautoff doesn't realize is that the numbers it produces are extremely complicated. Mathematically, these numbers won't be understood for a long time, and even now we don't have a complete picture. To understand Krautoff's method, let's work through the example in Krautoff's paper. There are four towns, A, B, C, and D. This year, during peak hours, there are typically 1,030 simultaneous calls where the caller lives in town A and the receiver lives in town B. While those 1,030 calls are happening, there are an additional 1,080 calls where the caller lives in town B and the receiver lives in town A. Roughly the same number, but a little higher. Here are the peak volumes between the other towns. These numbers are chosen to make some of the arithmetic work out nicely. Notice we're including calls within each town. So for example, there are 2,000 calls where the caller and receiver both live in town A. All this call data fits nicely in a 4x4 table, since there are four possible towns for a caller and four towns for a receiver. So, for example, the number of calls from town A to town B is the entry in the first row and second column. How many total outgoing calls are there during peak hours from each town? Well, that's just the row sums of this table. From town A, there are 2,000 plus 1,030 plus 650 plus 320 for a total of 4,000 outgoing calls. How many total incoming calls are there to each town? Those are the column sums. So into town A, there are 4,150 incoming calls. But next year, more households will have telephones. In town A, the number of households with a telephone is projected to increase 50%. So we expect the total number of outgoing calls from town A to increase 50% to 6,000. The total number of incoming calls to town A should also increase 50% to 6,225. In the other towns, telephone adoption is projected to increase 33% in town B, 25% in town C, and remain the same in town D. From this information, can we determine the number of peak hour calls between each pair of towns next year? In other words, what are the entries in next year's table? Here's Krautoff's method. We start by approximating next year's traffic data with this year's traffic data, since they should be closely related. Let's increase the precision to make things more interesting. We have to fix the row and column sums, though, because for the most part, they don't match the projected numbers. We fix the first row sum by scaling the first row. The row sum is 4,000, but it should be 6,000, so we multiply each entry by 6,000 over 4,000. For the second row, we multiply by 4,000 over 3,000, the third row by 2,500 over 2,000, and the fourth row by 1,000 over 1,000. Now the number of outgoing calls from each town matches the projection. The number of incoming calls to each town doesn't match the projection. To fix this, we scale each column. And then we're done, right? Wrong, because by scaling the columns, we broke the row sums. So what can we do? Well, we have to scale the rows again. Then we have to scale the columns again. Then the rows, then columns, rows, columns. Eventually, the entries stabilize. And now both the row sums and the column sums match the projections. So the entries in this table should be a good approximation of the number of peak calls between each pair of towns. If we're building telephone lines, now we know how many we need. Great! 
In addition to predicting telephone traffic, Krautov's method can also be used to predict car traffic or migration patterns. In the 21st century, it'll even find applications in machine learning. But mathematically, what are the numbers in this table, exactly? Take the top left entry, 3246.387. Is it rational? Or maybe it involves a square root? Or since it arises as a limit, is it expressible in terms of pi? Or e? This feels like such a basic question, but we don't have general formulas for these numbers. When I first learned about this, my reaction was like, this is really embarrassing. We've been doing mathematics for thousands of years. How can we not know what numbers we get when we iteratively scale a table? Well, a couple years ago, I started working on this with a high school student named Jason Wu. We thought, maybe we can use some modern tools to approach this question. And we ended up making pretty substantial progress. We're posting our paper today as this video goes live. Link in the description. We will get to what this number is exactly, but we have to work up to it, because the answer turns out to be ridiculously complicated. Let's start with 2 by 2 tables, because the numbers we get will be much easier to recognize. Then we'll graduate to 3 by 3 tables, and eventually to n by n tables. And for simplicity, let's assume that the target row sums are all 1, and the target column sums are all 1. For this table, the row sums are initially 7 and 10, and the column sums are also 7 and 10. So we play the same game. Scale both rows, then scale both columns, and so on. The entries start to stabilize, and in this example, they're pretty easy to guess. They seem to be 1 fourth, 3 fourths, 3 fourths again, and 1 fourth again. When the target row sums and column sums are 1 like this, we call this table the Sinkhorn Limit, after Richard Sinkhorn, who wrote a paper about it in 1964, unaware of Krautoff's earlier work. We'll write it like this. So in the Sinkhorn limit, each row and column adds up to exactly 1. What about another 2 by 2 table? Again, let's iteratively scale the rows and columns. These numbers are a little harder to recognize, but if you stare at them a minute, this 0.414 might remind you of the square root of 2. And in fact, they do involve the square root of 2. Okay, one more. I'll be extremely impressed if you recognize these numbers. They also involve a square root, but this time it's the square root of 6. For a general 2x2 two two table with positive entries a, b, c, and d, a formula for the Sinkhorn limit was found by Nathanson in a paper that was posted in 2018 and published in 2020. So this is quite recent. The entries are basically the square root of AD, the square root of BC, the square root of BC again, and the square root of AD again, then we divide each of those by the square root of AD plus the square root of BC. You can see that the row sums are 1 and the column sums are 1. Let's check that it works on this example. A times D is 4, and B times C is 36. 4 and 36 are squares, so the Sinkhorn limit only involves rational numbers and indeed it gives the values we guessed. You can check that Nathanson's formula works on these other examples too. And here's a question for you to think about. Why are the top left and bottom right entries necessarily equal to each other? And why are the bottom left and top right entries necessarily equal to each other? Okay, what about a larger table? Before Jason and I started working on this, even for 3 by 3 tables it wasn't known what the Sinkhorn limit is in general. Let's see if we can determine it for this example. Start with a healthy amount of precision, and then iteratively scale the rows and columns so they sum to 1. Now there are 9 numbers here that we'd like formulas for. But actually, it's enough to get a formula for just one. That's because the scaling process for Sinkhorn limits is highly symmetric. When the target row sums are all the same, and the target column sums are all the same, it doesn't matter what order the rows are in, or what order the columns are in. So if we start reordering the rows and columns of the original table, the Sinkhorn limit will just get reordered in the same way. This means that if we had a formula for one entry, say the top left entry, then we would get formulas for all the others just by permuting the entries. You can see this symmetry in Nathanson's formula. Suppose we only knew the top left entry. Well, if we reorder the rows, that's the bottom left entry. So we get the formula for the bottom left entry by renaming C to A, D to B, and so on. And if we reorder the columns, we get the last two entries. So for 3 by 3 tables, let's just focus on the top left entry. 
what is this number? Let's call it x. A reasonable guess is that since synchron limits of 2 by 2 tables involve square roots, then synchron limits of 3 by 3 tables involve cube roots. In that case, x would be a solution of a cubic equation. So we're looking for four coefficients, b3, b2, b1, and b0. For 2 by 2 tables, there's an analogous equation that we can get by calling the top left entry x and then doing some algebra to unsolve for x. What are the coefficients for a 3 by 3 synchron limit? Well, for any given table with positive entries, we can guess them using PSLQ, which is the technical name of a powerful algorithm for finding a simple relation among a set of real numbers. PSLQ is what Simon Plouf used to discover the famous bailey borwein plouf formula for pi, which amazingly lets you compute the nth base 16 digit of pi without knowing any previous digits. The hard part of discovering this formula is being imaginative enough to dream up the wild possibility that something like this even exists. Once you've done that, okay, you don't know the details, but you look for relations among tons of sets of constants. When you get to the values of these four sums, you ask PSLQ what these coefficients are, and it says, guess what? You just discovered one of the most surprising formulas in all of mathematics. Will we be as lucky with the top left entry of the synchron limit? When we ask PSLQ for a relation among x cubed, x squared, x, and 1, we don't get small values for the coefficients. If we increase the precision, which we can do by starting over and using more digits when we scale, then the coefficients are even worse. So a cubic equation doesn't seem to be the right form. In an act of desperation, we can ramp up the degree of the equation, hoping that at some point we get less information out of PSLQ than we put in. And at degree 6, that's exactly what happens. We get these coefficients. Now, they're not exactly small, but altogether they contain less information than the approximation of x that we're using to guess them. And if we increase the precision of x even more, the coefficients don't change. So that's really strong evidence that they're right. So x seems to be a solution of this degree 6 equation. Of course, x is not the only solution of this equation, just like for 2 by 2 synchron limits, the quadratic equation doesn't just have one solution. But if we compute all six solutions, sure enough, it's there. Okay, what about an explicit formula for x, like Nathanson's formula for 2 by 2 synchron limits? Well, if this were a degree 3 equation or a degree 4 equation, then there would be a formula in terms of radicals. But we've known since the 1820s that for degree 5 equations and higher, there's no general formula using radicals. So this polynomial is the best we can do. That's a bit of a shame because we like formulas. But guess what? The universe doesn't care about giving us formulas. In the 1820s, we learned that formulas are just the wrong way to describe solutions of polynomial equations. Polynomials are the right way. This polynomial is the exact description of the top left entry x. In 2019, I mentored two high school students in a summer project to run PSLQ on a large number of examples and try to see what's going on in general. Their experiments suggested that for 3 by 3 tables, the entries of the synchro limit always satisfy equations with degree at most 6. So why is it degree 6? And why are these coefficients the particular coefficients for the top left entry of the synchro limit of the table we started with? We'll answer the second question first. We actually have formulas for the coefficients, and we got them by solving a system of equations. Suppose the entries of the original table are a, i, j, and the entries of the synchron limit are s, i, j. Can we determine s11, the top left entry, in terms of the a, i, j's? Well, we know each row sum in the synchron limit is 1, and each column sum in the synchron limit is 1, so that gives us 6 equations. How do we get the synchron limit? Well, we multiply the rows by a bunch of numbers, and then the columns by a bunch of numbers, and then the rows again, and then the columns again. But since the order doesn't matter, we can think of it as actually multiplying all of the rows by infinitely many numbers each, and then multiplying the columns by infinitely many numbers each. If we collect all the numbers we multiplied the first row by into a single number, call it r1, and similarly let c1 be the product of all the numbers we multiplied the first column by, then in the top left entry, we got from a11 to s11 by multiplying by r1 and c1. Similarly for the other eight entries. This gives us nine more equations at the cost of introducing six unknowns, the r's and the c's. So overall we have 15 equations, and we have 14 unknowns that we'd like to eliminate, the eight sij's that aren't the top left entry, and the six we introduced. 
If these were all linear equations, we could do this with Gaussian elimination and end up with one equation. But they're not, because the r's and the c's are being multiplied by each other. Fortunately, there's a generalization of Gaussian elimination that works on polynomial equations. To eliminate the unknowns that we don't want, we can compute what's called a Grobner basis for the system. And this should give us a single equation involving S11 and the nine entries A, I, J. The problem is, it's much slower than Gaussian elimination. So sometimes computing a Grobner basis takes too much time or too much memory to be feasible. But with some tweaking, we were able to get the computation to finish. And the result is a huge equation of this form. S11 appears raised to the sixth power, which is what we expected because S11 is x, the number we're looking for. And brace yourself because here are the coefficients b6 through b0. So is that the answer? Well, it does give us a formula for the equation satisfied by the top left entry of the synchron limit. But an obvious question is whether there's a better way to write this. One that's maybe, you know, not awful. More importantly, is there some insight we can get here that will let us predict what the equations look like for synchron limits of 4x4 tables or 5x5 tables? Amazingly, there is. To see it, let's first look at the constant coefficient b0 and the leading coefficient b6. They're not too bad. b6 is the product of five factors, and each factor is a determinant. This last factor is the determinant of the 3x3 matrix with entries a, i, j. The other factors are determinants of 2x2 two two matrices, obtained by extracting two rows and two columns from the full matrix. But not just any two rows and columns. Since they all involve a11, one row is the first row, and one column is the first column. To write this in a more compact way, let's introduce this notation. Each of these deltas stands for a determinant. The upper set in each delta indicates which rows are involved in addition to the first row, and the lower set indicates which columns are involved in addition to the first column. For example, this first delta is the determinant of the matrix obtained by extracting rows 1 and 2 and columns 1 and 2. If we look at these five deltas, the only determinant involving A11 that we're missing is A11 itself. Let's include it for completeness and then multiply the left side by it to maintain equality. A11 is the determinant of the one by one matrix containing the single entry A11. And this determinant is obtained by extracting no rows and no columns except for the first row and first column. So the leading coefficient is essentially the product of the six possible deltas. The constant coefficient, b0, is also a product of determinants, although not quite as impressively. We have a 2 by 2 determinant here, four 1 by 1 determinants, and then a11 to the fifth. If we ignore the a11 to the fifth, the rest are determinants not involving the first row or first column. Is it a coincidence that we have five copies of a11 and five determinants? Probably not. Let's pair up the a11s with the determinants. Then we have five factors, all with the same form. So let's give them a notation too. Each gamma stands for a11 times a determinant that involves a certain set of rows and a certain set of columns, and these determinants never involve the first row or first column. Just like before, we're missing exactly one such determinant, the determinant involving no rows and no columns. In other words, the zero by zero matrix. You can check from the definition of a determinant that the determinant of the zero by zero matrix is one, which we can include easily enough. If we multiply by a11 again, then we can wrap up this one into a new gamma. So the constant coefficient is essentially the product of the six possible gammas. Now b6 and b0 are completely parallel. The six arguments to the deltas and gammas are exactly the same, and all that changes is whether we're applying delta or gamma. Great. What about the other coefficients, b5 through b1? Maybe we can get them by somehow interpolating between b6 and b0. Well, b6 involves the product of six deltas and zero gammas, and b0 involves the product of zero deltas and six gammas. So one guess is that bk involves the products of k deltas and six minus k gammas. For example, let's look at b1. 
The guess is that it involves products of 1 delta and 5 gammas. Well, there isn't just one of these products anymore. There are six, because we can choose any one of the six factors to be the delta factor. Let's write these six products like this, where in each one we're indicating which of the six factors is the delta factor. So for example, in M22, the 2, 2 factor is the delta factor, and the other five are gammas. We're using M here for monomial, because maybe, just maybe, we can write A11B1 as a linear combination of these six products. Now, it's hard to appreciate moments like this after the fact. When you're climbing around in the dark in a new area of mathematics, and you're the first people to try to find a way up, you have no idea what's going to work. You have no idea whether there's even a nice path there, let alone whether you can find it. So this guess, like many, many others, probably was not going to work. But by a huge stroke of luck, it did. In hindsight, it feels inevitable. But at the time, it was a miracle, because it let us see the structure behind Sinkhorn limits for the first time. It turns out there's exactly one way to write A11B1 in this form. You can actually solve for the missing numbers. This first number is negative 3, the next four are negative 1, and the last number is positive 1. And it's really nice that the four negative ones are all the same, since these four row and column specifications can all be turned into each other by reordering rows and columns of the 3x3 three three table. In other words, they all belong to a certain symmetry class. So these four negative ones reflect the symmetry we talked about earlier, where the row order and column order doesn't matter for Sinkhorn limits. And since the number out front is the same for all four, it makes sense to combine them into a single term. Here, sigma stands for the sum over the four products in the symmetry class. You can check that the other two products are in their own symmetry classes, and we'll write them with sigma also to make it uniform. What about the remaining coefficients? Well, first let's write b6 like this, since all of the factors are delta factors, and b0 like this, since none of the factors are delta factors. The remaining coefficients also have unique representations as linear combinations of the appropriate sigmas. So here's our theorem. These are compact formulas for the coefficients in the degree 6 equation satisfied by the top left entry of the Sinkhorn limit of a general 3x3 three three table. As a bonus, there's a beautiful symmetry that emerges. The numbers in the formula for b1 are negative 3, negative 1, and 1. Guess what? They're exactly the same numbers that appear in b5. And the same thing happens for b2 and b4. The numbers are exactly the same. So the coefficients b6 through b0 are symmetric. The coefficients in the first half of the equation contain the same information as the coefficients in the second half. Remember this number? It's the top left entry of the Sinkhorn limit of this table. Using our theorem, we can compute an equation that it satisfies. Here's what the theorem gives us. And this is exactly what PSLQ found experimentally, just with an extra factor of 16 that doesn't change the solutions. So this theorem gives the coefficients in the equation for any 3x3 three three table. What about our other question? Why is the degree 6? We can make a pretty good guess from these coefficient formulas. Remember that each coefficient bk involves products of k determinants that do involve the first row and first column, and 6 minus k determinants that don't involve the first row or first column. Because of this 6 minus k, the largest that k can be is 6. So larger coefficients just don't make sense. OK, but where does this come from? Well, whether we're requiring the first row and first column, or excluding the first row and first column, we always specify which of the other two rows and columns we're extracting. And how many ways are there to choose those rows and columns? We have to choose the same number of rows as columns in order to get a square matrix so that we can take the determinant. If we choose zero rows and zero columns, there's only one way to do it. If we choose one of each, there are two choices for the row and two choices for the column, so there are four ways to do it. And if we choose two of each, we're forced to choose both rows and both columns, so there's only one way to do it. That's where this 6 comes from for 3x3 three three tables. It actually counts something. It's the number of ways to take subdeterminants of a 2x2 two two matrix. So what about larger tables? 
For four by four tables, what should the degree of the equation be? Assuming the coefficients have the same structure, it should be the number of ways to take subdeterminants of a three by three matrix. The number of zero by zero determinants is one. For one by one, there are three choices for the row and three choices for the column, so there are nine determinants. For two by two, the number of ways to choose two rows is three, and the same for the columns. So again, there are nine, and there's exactly one three by three determinant. In total, that's 20 determinants. So we can expect the entries of a four by four Sinkhorn limit to satisfy degree 20 equations. We can even work this out for n by n Sinkhorn limits. This sum adds up the number of j by j determinants for each j from zero to n minus one. And it works out to be the binomial coefficient two n minus two, choose n minus one. So conjecturally, for n by n tables, the entries of the Sinkhorn limit satisfy equations with this degree. This means that entries of five by five Sinkhorn limits should satisfy degree 70 equations, and entries of six by six Sinkhorn limits should satisfy degree 252 equations. For two by two Sinkhorn limits, if we plug in n equals two, we get two choose one, which is two. Sure enough, this agrees with Nathanson's formula. The entries of two by two Sinkhorn limits satisfy quadratic equations. Incidentally, for n equals one, this predicts that the entries satisfy linear equations. You can think about why that makes sense. But to get this conjecture for the general degree, we assumed that the coefficients for n by n Sinkhorn limits have the same structure as the coefficients for three by three Sinkhorn limits. Is that even a reasonable assumption? For two by two tables earlier, we wrote out the equation we get from Nathanson's formula and its coefficients can indeed be written using sigmas. That's a good sign. So what are the coefficients in general? What are these numbers in front of the sigmas? Well, we got the equation for three by three Sinkhorn limits from a Grobner basis computation. And we tried to do the same for four by four. We couldn't get the computation to finish though. But we had a plan B, which was to interpolate the equation from numeric examples rather than compute it directly. For that part of the story, I'll refer you to our paper and simply say that yes, entries of four by four Sinkhorn limits satisfy polynomial equations whose coefficients can be written using the sigmas. The same seems to be true for five by five Sinkhorn limits. In fact, for general n by n Sinkhorn limits, we have an almost formula for the numbers in front of the sigmas. It's not quite a formula because there are some signs that we haven't been able to identify, but we think we understand the main structure behind them. So what does all this tell us about Krautoff's method for predicting telephone traffic? What's the top left entry in next year's table? This isn't a Sinkhorn limit, because instead of scaling the rows and columns to sum to one, we're scaling them to sum to the projected number of outgoing and incoming calls. This shouldn't make a big difference in the nature of the numbers though. Since this is a four by four table, we might guess that the entries in next year's table satisfy degree 20 equations, just like they do for four by four Sinkhorn limits. Well, for any particular table, a Grobner basis computation will give the exact value of the top left entry. And for this table, indeed, it satisfies a degree 20 equation. We don't know how our formulas for Sinkhorn limits generalize the Krautoff limits though. So we don't have formulas for these coefficients like we do for Sinkhorn limits. That's an open question. Maybe one of you can figure it out. <laughs>